We are now in the home stretch of this solutions topic. It's been a lot. There's a lot going on with solutions. There's all these different things about solubility, saturation, numbers, uh, conversion factors, how to determine whether something's soluble or insoluble. A lot to keep track of. A few more topics here we're going to end up with. One is a set of definitions of types of solutions. And there's three different types of solutions that we have. Remember, solution is a generally considered a homogeneous mixture. One of our definitions is going to stretch that definition, but it is still often used to talk about solutions. The first is what we have, and we're just going to call it a normal solution. And some people will call it a solute solution. And this example is like salt water, NaCl aqueous. You take salt, you put it in water, you can't see the salt, you can't easily separate out the salt uh, physically, you can't like filter it out or anything like that. And those things are very, 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 very tiny. The sodium ion and that chloride ion are very tiny, they can kind of go anywhere they want and do anything they want. So that's kind of a normal solution or a solid solution anytime you dissolve an ionic compound in water, for example. But then it turns out we can also dissolve bigger things in water and you get what's called a colloid solution. And that might be protein molecules, very large molecules that they can be sit there in water and they're maybe not dissolved in water but they're certainly not separating out from water. And some properties of colloid solutions is the proteins for example will stay suspended or stay, is that the suspended is where I want to do? Yeah. Indefinitely. Which means if I take a colloid solution of protein and I sit it on a shelf and I come back a year later, the protein won't have settled to the bottom. There's enough energy in the water to keep it mixed in there. It's usually not visible by the naked eye. And so you can't actually see it in there usually, but it has this neat property that it can scatter light. What do I mean by scatter light? Well, if you've ever been to like laser tag or anything like that, one of the things they do is they fog it up and they shine lasers through. So you can see the laser beam going through the room and it looks kind of cool or whatever. But normally if you shine a laser across a room, nothing happens. You can't see the laser beam until it hits something on the other side. What those little fog particles are doing is they're scattering the light. The light's hitting them, it's bouncing off of them, which allows it to bounce over to your eyeball, and you can see the laser light going through. Well, colloids can do that too. If you have a very, very intense light, like a little laser pointer, which is a very intense light, you can actually see it going through solution. So let me do an example. If you had a normal or a solute solution, and you shined a, let's just do a red laser pointer through it, what it would look like is the laser would go in, it would come out, and you wouldn't see it in solution. But if we take the same thing and we make a colloid out of it, what would happen is as you'd shine that laser through, you'd actually see that laser beam go through the solution. And believe it or not, I actually used this once in my life. There was a, a period where I had these two solutions in front of me. I knew one of them was a colloid and one of them was a solute solution. And I couldn't think of, at first of an easy way of distinguishing them because someone didn't write down on them properly what was going on. And then I remembered this. I'm like, hey, a colloid can actually scatter light. And so I went and I got myself a laser pointer. I went boop. And I could see that laser going through one of the solutions and not going through the other one. And I was like, oh, there we go. There's my colloid solution. So I've actually used this before, which is kind of neat. So that's what it means by scatter light. You can see the laser beam going through it. Or just a very, very intense flashlight will work as well. All right. They are still considered homogeneous because they are mixed together and you can't easily separate them. You can't take a coffee filter and separate these out. They'll probably just go straight through the coffee filter. And then our last type is what we call a suspension. Now these tend to be very large molecules. They tend to settle over time, 
which means if you take a suspension and you let it sit there, eventually when you come back, the suspension will have sunk to the bottom and the top will be, have not any suspension left in it. A great example of that is muddy water. If you take muddy water, you stir it up, it's very kind of homogeneous looking, but it's kind of dirty or whatever. But if you let that sit there for a week, the mud sinks to the bottom, you end up with relatively pure water on top and mud on the bottom. That's an example of a suspension. One way to recognize a suspension in medicine or in other daily life is if it says shake well before using. So a lot of medications are suspensions. A paint can, an aerosol can of paint, or an aerosol can of um, whipped cream, those are all suspensions. They sink over time, you have to shake them up to get them kind of dissolve back into the solution. These ones also can be very easily separated using simple filtration techniques like a coffee filter or you know maybe a fancy coffee filter if you're doing it in a chemistry lab. Very easily separated just by using um, filtration methods. So those are some definitions that we use. And again, definitions are important just for uh, expedience of language so that I can say, hey, I've got a suspension. Instead I say, hey, I've got this solution with very large molecules that settle over time and you can shake well before, you know. It's just a way of talking a little bit quicker. And so we just need to be familiar with those terms and the differences between suspensions and colloids especially. Our last topic is our say. Well, mostly our last topic is effects of solvation or another word that people use is colligative properties. What happens to the properties of water or something else when you dissolve something else in it? is pure water have the same properties as water with sodium chloride dissolved in it? And the answer is no. There's several properties about this water that change. The first one is the actual boiling point. Now, we remember learning earlier that boiling point changes with atmospheric pressure, but it also can change with dissolving solids in it. And why is that? Well, if we take our pure water here, we know that the boiling point is when the vapor pressure of the water coming off is equal to the atmospheric pressure pushing down, generally about one atmosphere, 760 torr, which occurs at 100 degrees Celsius. So at 100 degrees Celsius, I'm pushing up with 760 torr, I'm pushing down with 760 torr, and anything more that I do that causes the water to boil. But let's think of an example where instead of pure water, we have also in there sodium and chloride. Sodium and chloride. So we've got a bunch of salt in there. What's going to happen in this case? Well, let's think of a case where we had a lot of salt in there. So on the surface up here, there's a lot of salt, a lot of sodium chloride. Now, as we heat up the water, the water is trying to escape. Now, Think about salt. If you leave salt out on a hot day, does the salt evaporate? No, right? Salt doesn't evaporate. In fact, dissolved salt also doesn't evaporate. If you take salt water, you can boil off all the water and the salt is left behind. So this sodium ion's never gonna come off the top of that solution, right? It's gonna be stuck there forever. So right now we're heating up the water and in order for it to boil, the vapor pressure coming off has to be equal to the atmospheric pressure. But let's look at some water molecules trying to come up and become vapor. They hit that sodium there. That sodium's not leaving the solution. And instead of being able to come out and become vapor, he's stuck in there because he hits a sodium and bounces back. And so this molecule at 100 degrees Celsius that should be evaporating is not evaporating. What does that mean? It means my vapor pressure is lower. Not as many water molecules are able to come off because there's these sodium atoms or these chloride atoms that are blocking them from coming off and becoming a vapor. And so my vapor pressure is lower. So I'm just gonna make up numbers. I, I'm not gonna promise anything here. But at 100 degrees Celsius, right? Normally, this is 760 torr of vapor pressure coming off, but maybe now it's only 720 torr 
of vapor pressure because some of those water molecules can't get off. But it's 720 torr pushing up, still 760 torr pushing down. Is this going to boil? And the answer is no. So what do I need to do? I need to heat this up a little bit more. Maybe at 102 degrees Celsius, I get up to 760 torr, and now I boil my water. And so what we find is that the boiling point of something increases, and we have a property called boiling point elevation. The boiling point goes up because we have these what we call non-volatile, means they don't go into a gas, non-volatile sodium and chloride ions on top blocking the water from being able to come out and form a vapor, and so our vapor pressure is lower. We've got to increase the temperature in order to get that vapor pressure up. Boiling point elevation. Our next property, freezing point. What happens to freezing point? Freezing is an amazing thing, especially in water. What freezing is in water, if you've ever noticed, ice cubes float, which means they are less dense than regular water. And how can that be? How can ice be less dense than regular water? Well, it turns out when things freeze, especially water, they form these amazing cages of water molecules. It's, just, it's this very intricate dance of exactly how they arrange, and they arrange with space in them, a little bit more spaced out than they do in the liquid, because they form these beautiful cages and crystals and things like that. On a molecular scale, freezing of water is a beautiful dance. And so, in order to freeze, everybody's got to interact with each other just in the right way. And so you've got this water molecule freezing and stopping to move against this water molecule, optimizing the interaction of those two polar parts from the different molecules. And then you get these cages of water molecules forming. Like I said, it's a beautiful, beautiful dance on a molecular scale. But then what happens if I put in some sodium chloride? Well, well, look at this guy, right? You've got this little polar O interacting with this little polar H. But if I toss a sodium ion in there, what's going to happen? Well, this guy, my polar O, is going to want to interact with that. And my H over here is going to interact with a chloride ion somewhere else. And all of a sudden, this very fancy dance that my water was trying to do is interrupted by these kind of boisterous, loud, highly charged ions. And they're coming in and saying, hey, how you doing? And they're messing up this wonderful dance. So they're trying to get to each other. They're trying to stop and form these little structures. And these little toddlers are running in going and just messing it up. So when I get down to zero degrees Celsius, whereas normally I'd get these beautiful structures and I'd freeze and I'd stop, if I've got these other things moving around and messing with that, at zero degrees Celsius, I'm still not frozen. And I'm not going to sing anything about frozen because then Disney would take my video down. OK, so I'm not frozen yet. So what happens? In order to get these water molecules to play their little dance, i got to slow the toddlers down. How do I slow the toddlers down? I take the temperature down. And so maybe not 0 degrees Celsius, maybe minus 5 degrees Celsius. Everything slows down enough that my water molecules can do their little dance of freezing. And so freezing point, instead of being 0 degrees, is now minus 5 degrees. Which means if I have salt water at minus 4 degrees in this example, it's still a liquid. Even though normally ice would freeze at zero degrees and you wouldn't have a liquid ice at minus four, here, because those sodium ions, those chloride ions, and I'm just using those as an example, it can be any uh, compound that's dissolved in water, sugar as well, we've got minus five degrees Celsius as the freezing point now. <clears throat> All right, so what do we call this? We call this freezing point. And it's, a, it's a very sad name. Freezing point depression. We have depressed the freezing point. We've made it lower. And if you've ever made homemade ice cream, that's what you're doing. Homemade ice cream, what do you do? You take ice, you put in a bunch of salt in that, and then you put the cream in the middle of that, obviously, sealed off from the ice water. Why do you put that salt in that ice? Some people think, oh, it's to lower the temperature of the ice. 
But if you think about that logically, that doesn't work. You can't take room temperature ice or room temperature salt, put it with frozen ice, and lower the temperature of that ice, right? The room temperature of salt actually going to raise the temperature of that ice. What you're actually doing is if you're trying to make ice cream and you've got your cream in here, and you've got your salt chunks, I'm sorry, your ice chunks out here. At the interface here, what you actually get, instead of having ice up against the cream, right, here's our cream, because it's warm, you get this little layer of liquid water. Right? The ice melts just a little bit on the surface of that container that's got the cream in it, and so you get a little bit of liquid water. Now, we know liquid water, the coldest it can get is zero degrees Celsius. And so it turns out that if you just take ice and cream, you're never going to get a temperature of lower than zero degrees Celsius because your interface between the ice and the cream is actually liquid water, not the ice itself. And so you're never going to get the cream below zero, and it turns out cream will not freeze at zero degrees Celsius. So what do we do? We put a ton of salt in here. And when we put a ton of salt in here, we take the freezing point down from zero degrees Celsius to minus 10 degrees Celsius. And now these cold ice cubes, which come out of your freezer at about minus 20 degrees Celsius, these really, really cold ice cubes can cool down the water around it to minus 10 degrees Celsius, and that's what your cream interacts with, and cream will freeze at minus 10 degrees Celsius. Same thing for why they salt roads. If you've ever been in a snowy place, they put salt on the roads. What does that do? It helps melt ice on the roads because it changes the freezing point of the water down so it freezes at minus 5 or minus 10 degrees Celsius instead of 0 degrees Celsius. Now you'll notice they actually will never ice the roads when it's minus 20 out. You know, if you're up in North Dakota, you can experience that because that won't do anything because at minus 20, even the salt water will freeze. So that's freezing point depression, boiling point elevation. And there's one more important colligative property that we're going to talk about called osmotic pressure. And osmotic pressure is an amazing phenomenon. Boiling point elevation, usually one or two degrees, it's not very much. Freezing point depression, maybe five degrees, maybe 10 degrees, significantly more. Osmotic pressure is like the king of colligative properties. Very small changes in concentration cause these huge changes in what's called osmotic pressure. So let's look at osmotic pressure and see what it is we're talking about. What we have here is we've got a beaker. It contains just pure water on the left, and it contains water with something dissolved in it, in this case, sugar or sucrose on the right, and in the middle, there's this thing that we call a semi-permeable membrane. What semi-permeable means, semi means half, right? So sometimes yes, sometimes no. Permeable means things can go across. What this means is that water can go across this membrane freely, but the sucrose is trapped. It cannot go across that barrier that's in between the sides, and so the sucrose is trapped on the right-hand side of the beaker. So we start off with pure water on the left, the sucrose water on the right, and this barrier in between. The water levels are equal. You can see here that it's just an equal water level on the left and on the right. We wait over time. Now, what happens over time? Well, water coming from this side, there's nothing blocking it, right? There's never anything saying, hey, water, don't you go across that barrier. Water can go anything he wants. But on this side, water's trying to go across the barrier, and most of the time, he goes across the barrier just fine. It's not any problem, but occasionally there's a water molecule that's trying to cross this barrier, and instead of hitting the barrier and passing through, he hits a sucrose molecule and bounces back. And so we have slightly less water molecules going to the left than we do to the right. And so if you kind of draw a big arrow, we've got a lot of water molecules moving this way, less water molecules moving this way. And when we've got more water moving to the right than to the left, what's going to happen over time is that there's going to be an increase in the water level on the right, a decrease in the water level on the left. And over time, this side's going to go up in level, this side's going to go down in level. What does that do to the concentration on this side? It lowers the concentration on the right-hand side. It makes the sugar a little more dilute on the right-hand side. And that is what osmotic pressure is. The actual definition of osmotic pressure has to do with that height difference between the left-hand side and the right-hand side. We're not going to do any math. There's equations that talk about this, but we're not going to do any math with it. We just want to understand the phenomenon 
Okay, my um, OneNote just decided to quit. I'm not sure why. Okay, so we just want to understand the phenomenon that it happens and be able to talk about it a little. Uh, now, how big of an effect is this? Well, it turns out it's a huge effect. If you just take a relatively small amount of salt and pour some in, you can get heights of inches. Right? You can get inches up there. If you take a decent amount of salt or a ton of salt or a ton of sugar, you can get heights of hundreds of meters. Hundreds of meters of water level difference from one side to the other. Well, that's amazing. And why could you possibly use that for? Well, let's say you're a tree, like a really tall tree. How do you get water all the way up to the top of that tree? It's not like there's a little pump down at the bottom and there's somebody pumping water down at the bottom. Because how do you get water up to the top of that tree? You use osmotic pressure. You have sap inside your tree roots. And when you have sap inside your tree roots, there's water coming into your tree root, but not as much water coming out of your tree root. And you have a net raising of this water level all the way up to the top of your tree. And so that's actually one of the reasons that trees produce sap. That sap is a um, solute that can't pass through the semi-permeable membrane and <coughs> makes it so that it can raise water all the way up to the top of that tree. Really cool stuff. Osmotic pressure is actually really important in lots of different things physiologically, including our blood cells, which we'll talk about in just a moment. So those are our three colligative properties, boiling point elevation, freezing point depression, and osmotic pressure. No calculations in any of these. We're just gonna talk about the properties and be able to identify some of the things that happen in each one of those cases. All right, so last thing. Our blood cells are semi-permeable membranes. You can see a picture here of blood cells. What does that mean? It means that water can go freely inside and outside, but if you actually look at a blood cell, there's a lot of stuff inside a blood cell. There's all sorts of solutions and all other things in there. So if those can't pass through the blood cell, what do we have? We have now a semi-permeable membrane where stuff can go in or out but there's stuff blocking it on the way in. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about blood cells in different types of solutions. First, we're gonna talk about blood cells in just pure water. What do blood cells in just pure water do? Well, in that case, right, there's nothing blocking the water from going in, so we have a large flow of water into the cell. There's stuff blocking the water from going out, and so there's a relatively small flow of water going out of the cell and over time what's going to happen? This cell is going to fill with water because there's water going in it and it's going to grow right? and it might eventually burst. Now when a cell bursts we call it lysis and when a blood cell bursts it's hemolysis or I've also heard people say hemolysis or hemolysis. Right? So, the blood cell can actually burst. And I will always remember that because uh, I had Professor Purvis, hi Professor Purvis, for my biology uh, professor when I was in college. And one of the questions on a test involved investigating what was going on inside a blood cell. And you had to figure out how to do that. And I remember just thinking, well, how do I get the blood cell open? How do I get the blood cell open? And I eventually said, oh, you know, I just need to get the blood cell open. So I'm gonna assume that I have equipment to do that. And then I solved the rest of the problem. and. Uh, eventually, you know, I thought about that problem for a long time, and eventually, when I got the test back, I realized that all I needed to do was stick my blood cell in water, and it would have burst all by itself, no extra equipment needed. All right, what do we call that? Well, we say that the solution on the outside has a lower concentration than the solution on the inside, and so we're gonna call that a hypotonic solution. Hypo being less, right? Hypothermia, hypodermic, under or less. Tonic is concentration. So this solution out here has a lower concentration than inside the cell. And so we call it a hypotonic solution. And one of the things that can happen there is lysis. So a cell will swell and then it might burst. It doesn't always burst. Some cells don't burst, but some cells do. So let's do the opposite. Instead of putting it into a solution that has less stuff in it than the blood cell, let's put it in a solution that contains more stuff than the blood cell. So I can't do this and fill up the entire solution because it will take me 
way too long, but you can see around the edge here and obviously everywhere else, I've got this very, very, very high concentration of stuff. Well, what does that mean? It means that water is going to flow out. It's sometimes going to get blocked, but flowing back in, it's going to get blocked a lot. And so we've got a net flow out of the cell. So water is actually going to leave the cell. And in this case, the shell is going, cell is going to shrink or shrivel. And the fancy word for that is um, it's going to crenate or undergo crenation. That's what you talked about when you talked about cells. The cells crenate or undergo crenation, which is, means they're shriveling because they're actually losing water from the cell. Now, where might we experience that? And your first thought would be like, oh yeah, my fingers shrivel when I take a bath or when I'm in water for too long. But what is water? Water is a hypotonic solution. Your cells aren't shrinking, they're actually expanding. So why do we get all those wrinkles in there? Well, it turns out that parts of our skin are attached way deep. Parts of our skin aren't attached way deep. And so all the cells are trying to expand, but the cells that aren't attached deep can expand pretty far out. The cells that are attached deep can't, and so you get these wrinkles on your finger. But that's actually a hypotonic solution. Here, what we have, right, we have lots of stuff on the outside. You have extra. When you have extra sugar, you are hyper, and a hypertonic solution has a higher concentration on the outside than on the inside. And then one of the things that can happen there is crenation. Where do you experience that? If you've ever eaten super salty foods, like you eat a bunch of pretzels and you've got all that salt on your lips out there, your lips shrivel. And that's because you're literally sucking the water out of the cells of your lips from all that salt. That's a hypertonic solution. Well, what do you do if you don't want the cells to do anything? Well, you just make sure that on the inside and on the outside are roughly equal concentrations. And that's what we call an isotonic solution. Is the same inside as outside. so that nothing happens to your cells. When might you use that? IV fluid. You want to make sure that when you put IV fluid into someone, it's not going to shrink their cells or grow their cells or cause their cells to burst. And so IV fluids are specifically designed to be isotonic, to make sure that they are the same concentration as the cells around them so that they're not going to do anything to the cells. So those are our IV fluids. Okay, isotonic, hypertonic, and hypotonic. You need to know those and be able to understand what happens in each of those solutions, either lysis, crenation, or nothing in that case. So those are our topics for chapter nine, colligative properties in this section, uh, isotonic, hypotonic, and hypertonic, and also definitions of colloids, suspensions, and solid solutions. Thanks so much.